Uh, we started a series last week called The Favor of God. We're going to continue that today and wrap it up. It's just a little mini two-week series. But let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer as we jump into his word together. God, thank you for today. Thank you for the chance to study your word, open it up, and to receive from you. And I pray that we would continue to grow in our understanding of the favor you have for our lives so that we can walk in it, God. And so open our eyes to the truths that we're going to study today. And Lord, help us to be stirred in our own hearts to want the favor of God even more than we've had in the past. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are. We're talking the last two weeks, this last week and this week on the favor of God. And uh, we're, we're really going to look today at just kind of walking in that favor. I hope last week, you know, we set this up kind of by talking about uh, encouraging you to pray for favor, pray for favor over your life and over the lives of your family and, and even friends. I hope you've been at least doing that. If you didn't do anything else last week from the message, I hope you've at least done that. Uh, but last week, again, we looked at what the biblical idea of favor is because there's a whole lot of talk about favor, even in the church that gets it wrong. But the biblical concept of favor is God's grace, kindness, and influence upon our lives. We're going to continue to build off of that definition today. Uh, and I think we could all say, I want that, right? I, I really want the favor of God in my life. But how many of you know it doesn't always feel like you have the favor of God in your life? <laughs> you know, sometimes it just doesn't feel that you have it, even though it says that we do. So last week, we looked at three ways that we can uh, kind of lose God's favor in our lives. We looked at the very first way was that we tend to uh, replace God's kingdom with our own kingdom, right? And so when we do that, we end up building our own kingdom. And th that's the thing that happens is it often happens unintentionally, right? Because to build God's kingdom, we have to be intentional about that. But building our own comes natural, like building your own life and, and all of the goodness that you want, you know, we, we naturally spend our efforts on that. And so that, that's pretty easy to do. But when we do that, we re often replace building God's kingdom. So uh, we can lose God's favor in that. The second way we talked about was the destructive nature of comparison and how that can kill God's favor in our lives. And so I, I said it this way, think about this, okay? If you're looking down upon somebody, that's pride, and that's gonna kill God's favor. But often we also fall into the trap of putting ourselves down, which that means that we're kind of um, going against what God says about our own lives. And so that's going to squash God's favor as well. So we cannot uh, compare ourselves or we're going to lose God's favor. Listen, remember, God's glory is greater than the box. So you may not think of yourself much or you may not think of somebody else much, but that is not limiting God's glory uh, in that person's life or your own life. The third thing we talked about was we tend to lose favor because we touch defiled things and we need to have this pursuit for holiness in our lives. And so those are the things that will often take us out of God's favor. Today we're going to again spend time talking about what does it look like to now walk in God's favor. Uh, and there are certain characteristics that open up that door to our lives to walk in the favor of God. But before we get into that today, I want to be very clear about something up front. Because sometimes there's messages that um, will be preached and, and they're really relevant to everyone. And in some ways, they're always God's word is relevant to everyone. It's a call to everyone. But I want to make it very clear that to walk in the favor of God, to walk in the favor, not just to have it touch your life from time to time, but to walk in the favor of God, you must have a relationship with God. Okay, so you're not going to walk in God's favor by keeping him at a distance. But I want you to, to listen very closely to this. You can be a recipient of God's kindness and goodness at any time and in any state of your life. But each time you experience God's goodness, his kindness, that is God drawing you to his heart so that you can experience him more. We actually read this in Romans 2.4. He says, don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from, sin, from your sin? God's kindness never forces you to give up your sin, but it invites you to now turn from your sin. 
So every time you experience God's kindness, it's an invitation to say, hey, let go of that. But listen, he never takes away your free will. So you can cling to your sin, but I want you to understand this. You cannot cling to your sin and cling to God at the same time. Okay, clinging to God and clinging to sin just doesn't work. So to turn to God, you must turn away from your sin. That's what salvation is all about. It's about receiving the kindness of God to cover your sin. It's a gift that cost Jesus his life because he took your place and died for you. And we should never treat that lightly. That's why scripture warns us in Hebrews 10, 29, just think about how much worse the punishment will be for those who have trampled on the Son of God, who have treated the blood of the covenant which, was made, whole, which made us holy as if it were common and unholy and have insulted and disdained the Holy Spirit who brings God's mercy on us. What I want you to understand is the principles that we're going to study today is, again, for believers. This is for us. You cannot walk out this life of favor with God unless you're saved. Salvation is critical. It's key. And with that said, again, though, every saved person in this room is not always walking in the favor of God. Why is that? That's what we're going to explore today. I want to start by talking about uh, something that's really important, and we've talked about this before, but I, I want to bring it up because I think sometimes this, this key concept is, is really important for us to understand when there's this disconnect between what is real with God and then how we're experiencing it. And so I want to start off by talking about what's positionally true and what is experientially true in our lives. Because again, there's that gap sometimes between what is positionally true and what we experience. And so when we have that gap, it complicates things. For the Christian, what is positionally true is that you have the, all the favor of God that you need in your life. He's not held back on you. He's given you all of his favor. We read this in he Ephesians 1.3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So positionally, you do not lack anything from God. You have every blessing that God has for you right now. You've been blessed with every spiritual blessing. But did you notice that there is a certain location that that's true in. It says you have this in what? The heavenly realms with Christ. And so the, that, that's a real location, by the way, not a theoretical one. There's a real heavenly realm with Christ that you can experience it. But this is actually why there's often a gap between our experience. And, and I want you to kind of think about it like this, okay? Because I think this, this helps. You, you may have heard of a trust fund, right? And um, maybe you hope that you would have a trust fund, but you don't have rich parents. <laughs> but if you ever, you know of people, if you heard about trust funds, right? And so what is a trust fund? Well, somebody puts aside some money so that when you reach a certain age, now, now you're rich, right? Now you have access to, the, to those funds. There is something called an incentive trust fund, though. And you know what an incentive trust fund is? That's when the person knows, like, hey, I don't know if I trust my kid, <laughs> So uh, I want them to act a certain way. And if they act a certain way, then they will get the money. The money is theirs. It's an account for them, but it is not accessible to them until they live a certain way. And so you can say you're rich, but you have no access to the money until you actually live a certain way. Well, in, in a way, I think that is a picture of what we have spiritually, okay? God has given us every blessing that we need but he doesn't give it to us unless we act a certain way. Now, understand this. I want to be very careful because that could sound like God is making us work for his blessings, and that's not what he's doing at all. I, I don't believe that in any case. But we have his blessings, but you have to understand that those blessings are only accessed through faith. Okay, we live a life of faith to please God. And then we've, that opens a door for God to just pour out his blessings on us. And that's what I want us to focus today. How do we walk in those ways so that we have the favor of God and we learn, we, we can learn that. Well, we're going to do that through walking through the life of Noah today. If you remember who Noah was, Noah built the ark or he built the boat, and God saved him and his family, and at least two of every animal. In some cases, you know, there are seven or, or more. And God destroys the earth with a great flood. 
And that's the story of Noah. Noah's life, though, is a great example of walking in the favor of God. And we're going to see that and why that's so important. And so as we get into the life of Noah, though, I want to remind you something very critical. Because so oftentimes we read into these Old Testament stories through the lens of the New Testament. Through our experience, right? Our experience with Christ. But remember, this was before Jesus, Noah lived before Jesus. He lived before the Holy Spirit dwelled in people's lives typically. And yet, and, and so you and I, we take that for granted, right? We do. We, we, we start from that point, but they're not. And a lot of people don't realize this, though, about the Old Testament. The Old Testament is not a story always of judgment. It is a story often filled with grace. And you can see that in the stories. Unfortunately, the Old Testament has a bad rap. And so what do we hear so many people say? Well, the Old Testament's filled with God's judgments. And it is. But it's also filled with God's mercy and his grace. And so we tend to see the judgment and miss the grace. And then you flip over to the New Testament, and what, what do we tend to see? We tend to see the grace, but miss the judgment that is coming even in the New Testament. And so if you really have eyes to see, what you will see is both are present in the Old and the New Testament. God's mercy and God's judgment. They're both present and they're both there. I say that because the story of Noah is both a story of God's incredible grace and mercy, but is also a story of God's judgment. And both are there. And listen, if you're on the extremes, you're going to miss seeing both sides of the story. And so we come to this when it talks about uh, how wicked the earth is, by the way. God just didn't wake up and go, let's get rid of this earth. Uh, there's a story that talks about how wicked and evil the earth had become. And so God is deeply grieved over this. And he sees that he has to destroy the earth. But he says this about Noah in, in Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Notice it says Noah found favor. Remember we talked about that late, last week. He found it. He was looking for God and he found favor. And if you remember our definition, what's favor? It's God's grace and kindness and influence upon our lives. And so Noah has received God's grace in his life. He received God's kindness. And it becomes clear that he has received these because you could see God's influence all over his life, which is why when we read verse 9, it says this, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. And so the first part of walking in the favor of God is that we must walk righteous and blameless and faithfully with God. But that's the problem, isn't it? Because we struggle to walk righteous. We struggle to walk blameless. We struggle to walk faithfully with God. And so I think it's important that we understand what's going on here when God says that he looks down with Noah with favor and we understand what God means by that. God's not saying he looked down on all the earth and there's Noah and he's like, there's a righteous dude, let's save him. <laughs> That's not what he's saying at all. Listen, God saved Noah the same way he saves us. And this is what I think a lot of people don't understand is how he does that even in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We read this in the New Testament in Ephesians 2.8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not of yourselves, it's a gift from God. The difference between the Old Testament people who are saved and the people in the New Testament who are saved is that they receive the gift of a future promise where we receive the gift of a promise that's already fulfilled. But both received the promise in faith, whether it was the old or the new. And so God knew that when he offered Noah the gift to be saved, Noah would receive it. It was a gift, and he was willing to receive it. And so God gave him grace and righteousness, and he walked in that. In other words, he did not find favor with God on his own righteousness. He found favor with God, and, and he stood in God's righteousness, and God covered him in, in his own righteousness that God has given him. That's the same as us, right? We are covered in the righteousness of God. When you got saved positionally, God covered you in his righteousness. And so we, re we read this in Isaiah 61.10. Look at this closely. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Now listen, this is Old Testament. And we're reading this through New Testament eyes again, right? Well, he's clothed us in salvation and he's clothed us in righteousness. Same terminology of what God was doing in the Old Testament to his people. And so God works. That's how he works. He covers them. And this is vital because 
when he talks about walking in righteousness, he's talking about God's righteousness, that he's clothed us in and not our own. And again, positionally, you and I have been clothed with righteousness. But experientially, often what do we do? We change clothes. And so what's very evident is, is whether we're walking in his righteousness or in our own wickedness, right? It's very evident between the two. We read this in Galatians 5, 16 through 17. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. And they are in conflict with each other, so that you are not, uh, so that you are not do, to do whatever you want. And here's the deal. There's a war and a conflict within each of us. And it's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. Before you were saved, you didn't have that battle. Why? Because the spirit didn't reside in you. Sometimes people get frustrated with the battle, but the battle actually lets you know that you've come alive spiritually and God lives inside of you because now there's this battle between what's right and what's wrong, and it's there because the spirit is in you. And now the battle lines are drawn, and now you're open to attack to those things. But listen, you and I must cooperate with the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit. And what is amazing is, is Noah walks in righteousness and blamelessness in the midst of a wicked world that's so bad that God's getting ready to wipe it out. And we're not talking about some guy who lives in an easy peasy, easy time of life, right? This is a guy who, honestly, the world was probably worse then than it is right now. I mean, we're getting bad, but it was worse probably then than it is right now for us. And Noah is walking righteously. In fact, things were so evil and corrupt that God, he, he made a huge change in the life expectancy of humans and lowered the length of their days just to control the wickedness. We read this in, in verse 3 of chapter 6. And the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with mankind forever because they are corrupt. Their days will be 120 years. And you may have noticed that early on in the Bible, people lived hundreds of years. They lived hundreds of years at a time before they died. In fact, Noah's grandpa was a guy named Methuselah. Do you know how old, how old Methuselah was when he died? 969 years. He lived 969 years of his whole life. And the reason the age of life expectancy drops after the flood is that God is limiting the wicked people and how old they could become. Because remember last week, what did we talk about? We talked about defilement spreads, but holiness does not. And wickedness unchecked kept spreading. I mean, think about how wicked you become, could become in 969 years. People don't normally get better unless they have an encounter with Christ. And he changes and transforms them and gives them a new life. And so if you're going to be wicked, it's going to get bad and bad and bad. That's what it was going on in the days of Noah so Noah lived in an incredibly wicked world, and yet here he is living righteous, blameless, and walking with God. There's only one other person outside of the Garden of Eden that we read of that walked with God. And that's a guy who's also related to, Enoch, uh, to Noah. His name is Enoch. It's his great-grandfather. We read this in Genesis 5, 24. Enoch walked with God, and then he was not there because God took him. Enoch was so close to God that they're hanging out one day. Just walking along, talking, and God's just like, hey, let me just bring you home. <laughs> and, he, and he doesn't even die. And I think walking with God, though, is a very good description of what our life should be like with God. I want you to think about this. When you walk with somebody, it means that you're moving in the same direction they are. It also means that you're not ahead of them and you're not behind them. Otherwise, you stop walking with them, right? Right? So you're in step with them. And if you want to walk in the Spirit, that really is what God is talking about. You're going in the same direction the Spirit is going, and you're not ahead of the Spirit, and you're not behind the Spirit. You're walking with the Spirit. A person who is walking like this will find they're walking in righteousness, and they're living a blameless life, and they have the favor of God. Why? Because they're walking with God. And that's what we see in the life of Noah. Now, the second thing we learn from Noah is he listened to God when he spoke. 
We read this in verse 13. So God said to Noah, and I know, like, why do we stop in the middle of a sentence? Because sometimes that's just enough to grab your attention if you really look at what this is saying. Think about this. If you look at all the men and women throughout history, whether it's biblical history or Christian history, one thing you will see in every single one of them is they hear from God. People who are close to God hear from God. And it's an aspect of prayer that I think we're often missing today because it's becoming more of a challenge to hear from God than it ever has been before. If you look at the pattern of some of the patterns of prayer throughout Scripture, what you're going to find is that often God actually begins the conversation. We see it here with Noah, and God said to Noah, God started talking to him. God started conversations with people like Abraham, somebody like Moses, Solomon, and even a guy named Jonah, which we'll talk about in a minute. And I just want to ask you a question. When was the last time your prayer time began with God starting the conversation? Because I would say this, it's becoming more and more rare in God's people today. And part of the reason is, is we have so much noise that when God is trying to speak, we can't even hear him. You know, it's interesting when God speaks, he often ascends you to where you don't want to go to do what you don't want to do because it's hard and challenging. Think about this. Noah had to build a boat. God speaks to him and is like, gives him plans to build a boat. Abraham had to leave his homeland. Moses had to go confront Pharaoh, go back home where his, he was a wanted man. Solomon had to lead a challenging group of people known as the Israelites who were stubborn and hard-hearted. So much so that when God spoke to him, he said, give me wisdom, God. I don't know how we're going to do this. How can I rule these people? Jonah was sent to Nineveh, one of the most wicked places on earth during that day. One way you know that God is speaking to you is he begins telling you things you would not normally do. Listen, as long as you control the conversation, that never happens. God never sends you somewhere you don't want to go. Why? Because you're not praying that prayer. You're not telling God that's what you want. But when God gets a hold of the conversation, he begins speaking things into your life where you're like, I don't know if I want to do that. That's part of the reason why you know it's God. Yet most of us today, just again, we never think of listening because we're being bombarded with this noise in our culture. And so it's hard to create space to hear God. I believe that's one of Satan's plans. It's one of his plans to keep God's people from being sensitive to the voice of the Spirit of God in their lives. And most of us don't even know it's happening. We don't even know because there's just noise, noise, noise. It's, it's in hearing the voice of God that actually opens us up to his mission for our lives and the favor we need to walk in that mission. And one of the most important parts of my prayer times actually is when I stop talking and start listening to God. Because when I'm talking, I'm telling God all the things that I want him to do for me and all the things I think I need. And there, there's really nothing wrong with that because I, it's awesome. God is, God is incredible in that he invites us to what? Cast all of your cares on me because why? I care about you. So that's, there's nothing wrong with a prayer life that does that. But listen, something very important happens when I actually stop talking and give God a chance to speak. All of a sudden, he begins to show me something of what he's up to. And that often leads me to change the way I'm praying. Oftentimes, he brings up things for me to pray for that I never even thought I should pray for. I begin to learn his heart for the world. Not just he learns my heart for the things I want. I learn his heart for the things that God wants. And I know it's hard to listen. One of the practices that I've done that's that's been helpful to me, and and I know not everyone wants to do this, but I, I have a prayer journal and I have pages in my prayer journal that I just write at the top, listen. And I start off, I just pray a simple prayer like this. I start off and say, God speak to me and I'm here to listen. And then I just start writing whatever I feel the Spirit saying to me. Listen, you might go, 
Well, you're just writing down all the things that are in your head and you want God to say to you. And that happens sometimes. Here's the deal. It's written down. And every time I go back and read through that, I read the spots where I know God has spoken to me. And what becomes very evident is my voice and God's voice, which is actually beautiful. Because isn't that one of the biggest problems in prayer? Is I have a hard time discerning what is God's voice and what is my voice. But I actually learn that as I prayer journal. It becomes very evident what I'm saying and what God is saying. And it's a beautiful thing. And so I'm learning to recognize the voice of God in those times of prayer. One of my biggest concerns today is that so many Christians say they struggle to hear God speak to them. And some people I've even talked to, like, I haven't heard God speak in a long time. Please hear me out because I want to make a distinction here. I know the desire and the struggle to hear God speak into certain circumstances and situations in your life. When you're praying and you're desperately going, God, I really am praying for this, and God's silent, right? And you're wanting an answer. But don't confuse that with God not speaking to you. Because God is still speaking to you. He may not be answering the direct question you might be asking right now, but he is still speaking to you and wanting to deal with what you're going through. He may not be answering the direct question that you're wanting him to address, to, to address right now, but he is speaking. And often it's learning to listen to the things that he's actually trying to speak into your life right now that open you up and will lead you to the answer that you're begging him for. He's just not wanting to tell you that right away because he has other things that are important for us to hear from his heart before he gets there. And so I encourage you to listen to what he's saying, not just what you want him to say, because he's speaking. Now listen, if God is not speaking to you, though, there's actually a big problem in your life. Because it actually is imperative that you hear his voice. Let me give you two reasons why. First, John 10, 27 says this, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. Listen, if you're not listening to his voice, then you're not following him. The two go hand in hand. And there's zero ways around that. Okay? If he's not speaking to you, then you're only listening to your voice and you're living your life for you. You're not following God. And so if you're truly not hearing God speak, then it's a serious gut check to go, am I really one of his sheep? Am I really a follower of Jesus if I'm not hearing him speak? Which leads us to a second reason. It's important to hear his voice. We read this in Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is growing the more we hear God's word. And we don't know how to learn the voice of God without growing in our exposure to the word of God. There's just no way you're going to learn his voice if you're not in the Bible. That's because God's voice never contradicts his word. Do you understand that? How important this is. But it's the reason why so many people today are confused about God. They don't know him. They don't know his heart because they don't know his word. You can't know God and his heart if you don't know his word. And so you hear people say things like this all the time. I don't feel God would say something like that. Well, where'd you get that feeling? I mean, seriously. Where'd you get the feeling that you don't think God would say something like that? Or the God I serve would never judge anyone like that. Well, how do you know? See, it doesn't matter how you or I feel about God, about the way we think God should act. None of that determines who God is. Who God is is what he does, and what he does is revealed in his word. We read this in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. God doesn't change with the times or how we feel. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So listen, that's critical because what he said yesterday is true still today. That's why we know who God is. His word teaches us who he is. And we'll not consistently walk in the favor of God unless we consistently know the leading 
of his spirit through his word and, and know his voice. And many people get sidetracked because they're, they don't know the word. They don't know his voice. And so they're just making it up. And that never brings God's blessing in. In a world of noise, though, guess what? You and I, we have to be intentional to make space for God to speak. If we're not doing that, we're not going to learn his voice. Now, if we're hearing is just the first part of it, right? If you hear the voice of God, that's just one part. But then, once you hear what God says, now you have a choice. Do I obey or do I disobey? We already mentioned Jonah. God spoke clearly to him. Go to Nineveh and preach so that they have an opportunity to repent. And if you know the story of Jonah, Jonah clearly heard God's command, but he also clearly disobeys. (laughs) And what does he do? He gets on a boat going the opposite direction of where God told him to go. That's actually how a lot of us act, right? God has clearly spoken. I know it. We hear it but I'm not doing it. And we don't do it because why? This might sting a little. We don't do it because we don't want what God wants. That's really the issue. Jonah ended up going to Nineveh only after God let him sit in the belly of a fish for three days and finally gets vomited onto the land, all stinky from being in there. And he goes reluctantly even. God uses his horrible preaching to bring repentance to the Ninevites. And he ends up seeing, God sees that 120,000 people in this city. Think about this. 120,000 plus Ninevites are repenting before God. There's mass revival and Jonah's actually mad about it. He has the audacity to get mad that people turned to God through his horrible preaching. We read this in verse 2. So he prays to the Lord and says, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I knew that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. He knew God's character and didn't want what God wanted. He didn't want the Ninevites to be saved. He wanted them to go to hell. Could it be true that a lot of us don't have God's heart? We don't want people to be saved. We're okay with them going to hell. And often, that describes us more than we would like to admit. I don't have the heart that God has. And this is why we disobey. Instead of we walk in obedience, but not Noah. Genesis 6.22, Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. Sometimes our obedience is challenging not because we don't want what God wants, but sometimes it's we don't understand what God wants. That actually makes sense, right? Because if his ways are higher than my ways, what he's asking me to do is often not going to add up, right? It's not going to make sense to us. God tells Noah, hey, build a boat on dry ground. Doesn't make sense. People are making fun of him. All of his friends and neighbors are coming by laughing at him for building this boat in the middle of dry land. The project takes anywhere from 50 to 100 years to complete, depending on what scholars you read. 50 years even is a long time. 100 years is even greater. Obeying God is not an easy task. But let me just say this. Maybe it's not so hard as sometimes we make it out to be. I say that because I know there are certain times where God has spoken into my life. And because he spoke, it makes what's hard possible. It makes what going through to get what he's told me he wants me to do, uh, it makes me not give up, not to throw in the towel. For instance, I knew God called me to be a pastor when I was 12 years old. But you know, the road wasn't easy getting there. (laughs) There are a lot of things that could have derailed that. And that often tried to derail that. But what happened was so many times I began questioning, is really this is what I'm supposed to do with my life? Is this really the direction I'm supposed to go? God reaffirmed that call. And it was his word that he spoke to me. See, when God called me, it was during one of those moments when I was praying and I said, speak, Lord, for your 
child is here listening, and I wrote it down, and I would lose that piece of paper for years sometimes. But there are a few times when I was seriously doubting, and I would come across and read that paper. And there was God saying, you're called to be a pastor. And he reaffirmed that. And see, I believe God does that in our lives. It's his word that actually says, okay, no, I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm going to do this thing. His word gives you the strength and the power to keep going. I believe that's why trust is so essential to obedience. If I don't trust God, I'm not going to obey. Which is actually the problem with disobedience is it actually says, I don't trust you, God. It reveals that we really don't trust him. But if I trust, I will obey. That's why there's that song, what, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but what? To trust and obey. It's so vital and so true. Listen, the favor of God always follows obedience to him. And there's no shortcuts to our obedience. As we close today, I want to ask you a question. What are you doing right now in your life that needs God's favor to show up for you to accomplish what you're doing? See, God's favor follows God's plan and his purpose is not our own. And I just want to be very clear that we're not talking about the favor of God and all of his works and all of his glory like a lot of other churches do where they talk about the favor of God as being your personal success, your wealth, your finances. God wants to give you favor, so you have all of that. I don't think that's biblical even. I believe that's not the favor you see in the Bible. The biblical favor you see in the Bible focuses always on the great work that God is doing. Think about just the people we mentioned today. Noah. Why, why did he have God's favor? Because God wanted to start over with this world. Abraham, why did he have God's favor? So that the world would be blessed through him. Moses, why did he have God's favor? Not for himself, to lead Israel out of slavery into the promised land. Solomon, why did he have God's favor? To lead God's people and his nation to build this temple for the glory of God. Why did Jonah have God's favor? So that Nineveh wouldn't be destroyed and might come to salvation. See, favor always follows God's plans and God's purposes. It's not to enrich you for your life and your plans and your purposes. It will often, but it's not the end of it. It's to go through because God's setting you up for something for his kingdom and glory. Listen, on Friday night, Carrie and I had the opportunity to participate in a celebration. Many of you know she uh, hosts a Bible club in her school but with that Bible club at her school was a group called Decision Point who equips students to be leaders in their schools and helps them establish their Bible clubs and spread the gospel. And so we were having a celebration night uh, with the area schools and some of the people. And uh, we left being so encouraged and challenged by two, two 16-year-old boys and an 18-year-old girl in particular who are walking in the favor of God. Two 16-year-old boys this year started Bible clubs on their high school campuses. And <laughs> one of those boys, it took over a year jumping through all kinds of hoops with the administration just to get permission to launch that Bible club. And it shouldn't be that way, but it often is. But he persevered. He didn't give up. And as he talked about how he saw God move in his personal life in school, what you heard was this joy and this passion for all that God is doing. The 16-year-old, guess what he's doing with his summer? He's spending it studying scriptures and praying for this next year because he wants to see even greater things happen on his school campus this year. This is a 16-year-old boy who's spending the summer in prayer and studying God's word so he's ready to go. The other 16-year-old boy talked about leading four friends to Christ personally this year. He led four of his friends to Christ personally this year. How many of us have led four people to Christ in our lives? And a 16-year-old boy is walking around sharing his faith so boldly 
that four of his friends have received Christ this year. He too faced opposition and being made fun of by so many people, and yet, you know what? It's making him stronger. It's pressing in more to God. One of these boys just said they were meeting with one of their uh, high school or college sponsors who come in and help train them. He's like, um, hey, can we just go witness today? <laughs> like, I know you're here to train me, but can we at least spend 30 minutes of just going up the street and talking to people about Christ? Like, that's how passionate this kid is. An 18-year-old girl, she was part of a team who they couldn't quite get on the campus to uh, minister to the students, but there's a church right next to the high school campus. And so the church allowed them to meet up in their parking lot and just minister. And they had hundreds of students showing up. And she talked about this one day where she sat down next to a suicidal, depressed girl who said, I was going to kill myself. And they shared Jesus with her. They walked away and never saw her for months. Months later, had an encounter with her and her whole life has changed from that day on. You know what was evident with every one of these kids? Their passion, their joy, and their energy to be used by God and to make a difference in this world. What's sad is that should be the norm of every Christian's life, and it's not. Standing around talking about what God has done and how we can't wait for the next moment when we can see a life change should be the norm, and it's not. At 16, they're already being used by God powerfully, and they're hungry for more. Revival's coming to their schools. Because why? They're stepping into the call of God and not sitting on the sidelines. And guess what? The favor of God is following them. His favor is following them. Why? Because God's favor follows his plans and his purposes. And I want us to know the mission is real. And I believe that many of us are missing the favor of God today because we want it for us and not for him. And we're missing out. We're missing out because we're missing out on the passion and the joy and the energy that God wants to fill our lives so that we make a difference in the world. May God stir our hearts for him. Because you know why he wants to stir us to live righteous and blameless? To long to hear him speak to us, to follow what he says? All of that. So that it goes out into the world and accomplishes something great for his honor and his glory and his kingdom. And if we're not seeing the favor of God in our lives, I think a good place to stop is going, am I doing anything that they even need his favor to show up. Because if we are, his favor will follow us.